The world has been confronted with horrific images of atrocities against civilians allegedly committed by Russian forces in Ukraine. We can find a courage and, and, and call it a genocide because there is so much resemblance uh, of uh, the events of 20th century. How should Western allies respond? My guest on Conflict Zone is Lithuanian Foreign Minister Gabrielis Landsbergis. He joins me on the line from Vilnius. If Putinism, which is more than just one person, if it stays, that means that this country will be ready to, uh, to deploy aggressive tactics on war against its neighbors again. And this cannot be allowed. As the EU debates the next round of sanctions, Lithuania has already moved to ban Russian energy imports. It has long urged a tougher line on Putin's Russia. How tough are allies willing to get now? And how far does he think Putin's war in Ukraine could go? Join me for all that and more on Conflict Zone. Foreign Minister Lance Bagus, welcome to Conflict Zone. Good morning. We have seen the images of, of bodies scattered along the streets in Bucha on the outskirts of Kiev, some apparently shot with their hands tied behind their backs, allegedly by Russian forces. President Zelensky calling this a genocide. Is it? I think that we, uh, we can find a courage and, and, and call it a genocide because there is so much resemblance uh, of uh, the events of 20th century. Uh, that we thought that belong in uh, history books. And uh, we keep, uh, we have to remind ourselves on, uh, on those events, compare them and, uh, and find the exact, exact wording for, for how, to, how to call it. But then again, I think it's also as important not only to, uh, to call it what it is, but also to find those who are responsible for them and bring them to justice. Indeed, uh, Ukraine has demanded an investigation into alleged abuses by the International Criminal Court, um, that the International Criminal Court, in conjunction with Ukraine and the EU, in investigate um, these alleged abuses. Do you realistically, though, see Putin or a senior general being brought before the ICC to face justice? Well, I think the, the procedures are there for, for that reason, and we have to... Uh really take all the necessary steps uh, that are available to us. That means that we have to investigate. Uh, we have to um, identify all the victims, uh, identify the perpetrators, and if possible, yes, bring them to justice. And now only time will tell whether those exact people who committed when you say alleged, uh, I think that, you know, at least from, from my part, I, I can be certain who, uh, who is behind this. Uh, we, we know even the, the battalions, we know even the troops, even now we know them by name, who were occupying Bucha. Uh, to add to that, we know people who gave them orders uh, because they did that in public. So there is no, uh, a lot of room for allegedness in this, in this case. Uh, and then again, I would really, I would really hope to see them brought to justice. What more do you think we know? Can you share some of that information with us? Because I mean, we're we're hearing from the likes of Human Rights Watch saying that they have documented cases of rape, summary executions by Russian forces. Um, it's citing unspeakable, deliberate cruelty and violence against Ukrainian civilians. Zelensky has warned of worse atrocities yet to be uncovered. And he, he's pointing to areas in particular um, in the west of Ukraine that, that have also been um, occupied by, by Russian forces. What is your intelligence telling you right now? Well, it is clear that Russia, Russian troops were using a, uh, a deliberate terror tactics against civilians uh, in order to, uh, to press for, uh, for results as fast as possible. When they failed at, uh, uh, on the military field, then they turned to, to civilians. And this is what we are actually seeing now. And I agree with the, with the saying that probably the worst is yes, yet to be revealed. Uh, unfortunately, we have to be uh, well, mentally also prepared for, for the fact that uh, the more territories are liberated by Ukrainian army, the more atrocities we will, uh, we will know of. And therefore, again, we have to be ready and prepared with a legal framework. 
so that we not only the political reactions would be needed, but also uh, concrete measures that would be taken by uh, by the Western uh, by the Western world with the tools that we have. There was hope, and I'd, I'd like to just address that um, that hope that that we heard last week that Putin might actually scale down his offensives. Um, Moscow said it would focus on liberating Donbass, draw back from the capital, Kiev. Was that a pull down or a ploy? I think it's it's theatrics. Um, uh, I think that what we're seeing is a regrouping uh, because of the failures on the military field. We can uh, we can admit and uh, not sure whether the uh, generals in Russia would be brave enough to admit, but they are losing in the in the field. And that is why they are retreating and regrouping further to the east, because this is where they might still think to achieve some certain uh, military victories. To add to that, uh, I think that um, the sanctions are kicking in. Kicking in. And uh, uh, I'm quite convinced that uh, the government in, in, in Kremlin is trying to do its best in order to stabilize uh, the economic situation, but it can only hold so long. So that means that they need uh, some sort of a debate to start about uh, about the retreat, about their pragmatism that is starting to show off. Uh, but I think it's it's all theatrics, and we not need to give into that. You mentioned the word regrouping, um, and I'm just wondering what you think comes next after such a, a so-called regrouping. Um, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, for example, has said we can expect additional offensive actions bringing even more suffering. How far do you think Putin is still willing to go? Well, I think that everything is still on the table. Um, the more losses he uh, he achieves, so to say, I think the, the, the more cruelty we might be, we might be seeing. And uh, <clears throat> with a, with a regrouping uh, further to the east, and with this um, uh, 9th of May date uh, closing in, I think this is where he will have his parade. One way or another, he will have his parade, even if it's a parade on the ashes of, of Mariupol or, or some other city. So, um, so therefore, we have to be prepared for that, first of all, as I mentioned, mentally. But secondly, with additional waves of sanctions and further assistance to Ukraine, nothing has uh, been won yet. There were some victories in the field by Ukrainians with the Western support, but that, that, that has to continue. You seem to be describing a, a leader in a state of desperation. And so I'd just like to ask you how effective you think those measures, uh, those, those, those ratcheting up of sanctions can be. Because as the EU weighs those tougher penalties on Moscow, you already announced an end of imports on Russian oil and gas, the expulsion of the Russian ambassador from your country. Do you really think that these moves can impact Putin's calculus? or deter further atrocities against civilians? I think it's very important to talk about the, uh, the end game here as well. And uh, we are, you know, we very often talk about the tactics of the, of the current events of what's happening in the field. You know, Bucha and, and, and the sanctions is still tactics. We have to talk about the end game. So what is the expectation? And I can tell you that our expectation is uh, the end of Putinism end of ideology that is currently running Russia. And therefore, everything has to be employed in order to achieve that. Because if Putinism, which is more than just one person, if it stays, that means that this country will be ready to, uh, to deploy aggressive tactics on war against its neighbors again. And this cannot be allowed. Therefore, if a country, you know, be it a small country like Lithuania, we have our own tools that we can do, we can employ, we will do that. And uh, you mentioned several steps that were taken by, uh, by Lithuanian government. One of them is, uh, uh, is a very important, I think, that is uh, cancelling the, the contracts and gas contracts. And I think this shows the way that mm. it is possible to do that. And you've, you've very much been out front on this, we have to mention. Uh, you've been one of the fiercest advocates for harsher sanctions against Russia. You, you've called on your EU partners to act with you and impose an all-out ban on Russian oil and gas. But we've already seen it. Germany, Hungary, Austria, they've already pushed back on that. Does the pushback shock you? I think no, 
nothing can shock me more than the massacre in Bucha. And I hope that this is, uh, this is shared by my colleagues. Because in, in essence, when you think about it, is uh, when we're paying money to Russian government, uh, be it for gas, oil, you know, other ex extracts from, you know, from, the, from the soil, um, in a way, we're paying salaries to the soldiers who are committing those uh, uh, massacres in, in cities like Bucha. So there is a very, very, uh, very short link between the, the amount that is being paid and, and the army that is able to, uh, to do what it does in, in Ukraine. So I think that that has to be the main, the main argument. But haven't we seen this story before and aren't there lessons to be learned? I mean, because you've long been calling for more meaningful action against Putin's aggressions. Uh, and I'm thinking in Chechnya, Georgia, Crimea, your prime minister um, said recently that, that the West was always pressing the snooze button because, and I'm quoting here, um, the Russian money smelled too good. How worried are you that the West could, could press the snooze button again? I mean, we're seeing some of those cracks in, in unity in the EU. There is this worry. Uh, there is this worry that uh, somebody would, would say, okay, we need to normalize this, the, the, the situation again, as if the normalization has, come from, has to come from, from, from us, from the West. Um, therefore, I'm saying, look, even though we've, you know, we, we've said that in 2008, uh, in Georgia, 2014, the first attack against Ukraine, those were already situations that were not normal. They were already um, destroying the, you know, the rules-based security order, European, if you may. Uh, now, I think that the order that we've so much tried to preserve is, is different. It has to be different, and we have to be very active in creating this new, new situation that would guarantee the safety for everybody in the region. So, tell me just briefly, then, what do you think is going to be in in the next sanctions package from the EU? How how strong could it possibly be? Well, I'm I'm definitely going to uh, to push for um, for energy sanctions, and I know that it's a you know it's a big bite. It's it's a difficult thing to agree upon. Uh, maybe we can we can approach it. Um, uh, you know, step by step, so to say. So I think that the, the oil embargo could be introduced as, as early as, as next week when we have a uh, minister's meeting in, in Luxembourg. Uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier um, in our conversation the whole concept of, of Putinism and, and the way that he has been governing the country. Um, and I'd like to ask you, uh, U.S. President Biden said in Warsaw that Putin could not remain in power, something that, that you agree with. But both he and you, you have stressed that you are not calling for regime change. If not regime change, then what? Because there doesn't seem to be much chance of him being ousted by the public or others who are close to him. Well, I think that the, the main thing here is uh, that no Western country is saying that we are pushing for a regime change or either Lithuania or United States would do uh, would take active measures in order to re for regime to change in Russia. Uh, I think that it's way beyond at least our, our reach, so to say. But then again, if we want to see a world coming back to a, some sort of normality, that cannot happen with uh, Putinism in charge in Russia. And why I'm stressing the, that it's not just about the leader, because in many cases you can change the leader, but still retain the system. So it is more than just a leader. It's obviously more than just a war against Ukraine when it will end. And that does not guarantee that the world will come to, to some sort of normality. So in general, we have to be prepared for, I would say, a long winter, a geopolitical long winter. How nervous does that make you feel for, for, for your security and, and your peace of mind? You're right there on the border. Yes. Well, first of all, you know, I would say that we've been training for that <laughs> for, you know, and uh, we were the, those who would say that, look, this is not a secure and safe world that a lot of what we're seeing that after the, uh, the architecture, the security architecture, after the cold war, many of that is just a facade. And on the other side of the facade, what we felt in, in the Baltics was an aggressive, regime 
with uh, quite a lot of imperialistic ideas and ideas of how to rebuild the world that it has lost. So I would say that we are not nervous to the point where we knew what is behind the facade. So we're not that much surprised. Uh, but we would like uh, for the West and our allies now to take this new reality adequately. And it has to be confronted with, I mentioned, you know, with the actual assistance to Ukraine and stepping up with assistance to mm. Ukraine, but also uh, securing, securing the Baltic states. And this is one of the things that we are raising in, in NATO format that NATO has to address this, um, this new reality uh, with practical measures, with additional security guarantees in, uh, for, for the region. And, and along those lines, I mean, President Zelensky um, has, has been even more dramatic um, in his assertion of, of, of the challenges that you might face. He, he said, in fact, last month, if there is no more us, then God forbid Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia will be next. Do you realistically fear that you will be next? Well, I can tell you with all certainty that uh, and when, when we are saying that Ukraine is fighting not for it, only their own country, but also for the Baltics and other surrounding countries like Moldova or Georgia, we mean it. This is actually what we are thinking. If Putin is not stopped, if he does not lose in Ukraine, then he will go further. That is, that is a fact. And fortunately for us, Ukrainians are doing everything that they can in order to stop Putin in, in his track. NATO has, uh, and the West in general, has very much recently been patting itself on the back, um, you know, declaring how unified it is, uh, what it is doing to shore up its eastern flank. And so I'm just wondering what your assessment is of, of the measures that we've seen so far. Your Minister of National Defense says that the number of NATO troops has increased by a thousand since last year. It will now increase by a similar number. Is that really good enough to defend against the threat posed by Russia? I think it still does not reflect the new reality. Uh, I mean, we, we, we see and we very much value the solidarity that was shown by our partners. And uh, many, many of them uh, have shown uh, solidarity. You know, Germany, Netherlands, Norway, uh, United States, obviously. And then many countries have shown that you know, they, they support us and they understand the situation. But then again, if we're talking about the alliance, I think that we're still haven't reached the level where we would address this this new reality, because it is it is a dramatic change. Because, you know, to tell you the truth, uh, before twenty fourth of February, um, we would have uh, several Russian uh, exercises outside of Lithuanian border. It will happen every four years or so, right? Now we have. Russian army fully armed in with intention to attack with rocket launchers or every equipment in in Belarus and we're talking just a geographic change that is dramatic than than it was that it was before basically Russia brought its army fully equipped on NATO borders not only to attack not only not only to attack Ukraine but also to intimidate NATO so NATO has to react we cannot take it as business as usual and in fact, NATO says that it will adopt its new strategic concept in Madrid in June. Uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg has promised that it will accelerate the transformation for a more dangerous strategic reality, such as the one that, that you described there. What would you need to see for that to ring true, to, to ultimately move from deterrence to defense? on your borders. So you, you mentioned probably the, uh, the most significant thing that we are looking into is, uh, is a political, first of all, uh, approach towards the situation. Uh, before we, we, we thought and we, we committed to, uh, to what is called a, a deterrent strategy. That means that we are sending a very clear message to anybody who might be interesting to try something on NATO's borders that um, you would get an answer one way or another. Now what we would like to see and agree politically, first of all, that these, this territory, these countries, and first of all, the Baltic states, who are in a you know, strategically uh, different situation, uh, knowing our relatively small size, and even Lithuania situation, where we have Russia to our west, uh, on our western border, and Belarus on our eastern border, 
So that we would like to see that the strategy would be that these countries can be defended and will be defended with a very specific uh, uh, troop numbers, with a very specific equipment and air defense and all the things that are needed in order to defense, defend the three countries. Has Europe learned from its mistakes with Putin, you think? Uh, I mean, you're, you're, you're in the room. You have conversations with your, with your counterparts throughout the bloc. Should it start pushing back harder against other authoritarian states, for example, like China and Xi Jinping's uh, accumulation of power there? That's an excellent question, uh, because I think uh, that every authoritarian country is working from the same textbook. Um, it's building the same um, leverages against, uh, against its, its trade partners. Um, now, why we cannot um, uh, make certain steps, political steps towards uh, Russia, because our dependency is just too great, right? And uh, I think that other, uh, you mentioned China, I don't think that there is a lot of difference in, in building that dependence of the West on the supply chains, on the, uh, some of the, um, again, some of the rare earths, let's say, you know, that, that are needed. And the dependencies then will limit our maneuvering space one way or another, where we will be limited with our response, with our action. And I think that is ultimately wrong. And we mentioned, you know, that with the situation in Ukraine, you've very much been, been out front on, on banning Russian uh, oil and gas imports, on also um, expelling uh, Russia's ambassador to your country. You've also been very much out front um, on China as well. Um, you've been in a s dispute specifically after deepening ties with Taiwan. Why is Taiwan s of such interest to you in particular? Because I mean, so many countries around the world, they finesse the Taiwan name issue by using Taipei, finding a way to have relations with Taiwan while keeping China appeased. You chose to stand up to China, why? Well, I think that it's a um, few, few points that I would like to address. First of all, Taiwan is an important partner. And everybody agrees about that, especially, you know, in uh, in trade, when uh, when even the, the big economies in Europe suddenly find themselves lacking semiconductors and, and, and things like that. So and uh, where do you turn to and who do you turn to is, is Taiwan. So obviously there is a, a practical reasons why a country like Lithuania would think that there is a need to uh, to deepen its trade ties with with Taiwan. So that's normal. The second thing is the question of sovereignty. We have our, our Lithuanian One China policy that we adhere to. It's, uh, it addresses the, the, uh, the questions uh, of, of uh, China's integrity and all that. And China doesn't like uh, or does not approve our One China policy. Therefore, it wants us to change it. And since it does not uh, have means uh, to persuade us politically, then it chooses um, another or different leverages to, 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 you know, to basically to coerce us, to pressure us, to change our stance uh, when it comes to our national, national interests. And this is where I think that a very important uh, question is being raised. Can a country like Lithuania defend its sovereign legal decisions on its foreign policy when it suits our national interests? And I think that obviously a country that is a part of the European Union, a country that is a part of NATO, has an obligation to defend its sovereignty in cases like these. I'd like to ask you, because you talked about uh, you know, powers of coercion as well. Um, you know, China has so far refused to condemn Putin for the invasion. Uh, despite calls in the EU uh, for, for it to do so in particular. Do you have any hope for China playing an active role in, in stopping the war? Well, <laughs> honestly, not a lot of uh, optimism from, from my side. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, that, that this gray zone of uh, supposed neutrality in the question uh, in, in, in this uh, Russia's war against Ukraine is uh, has reduced to almost nothing during the last last month. Maybe you could have some doubts okay. uh, at the beginning. I, I could have understand that. But 
you know, when the war drops, draws uh, further, you know, when there, we're seeing the pictures from, from Bucha, basically you have to make a stand. And if you're not making a stand, I would say that you actually are making sort of a stand as well. I'd like to ask you just briefly before we go, what do you think Europe looks like a year from now? I think that Europe uh, is forged with crises and uh, this crisis will make us stronger. Foreign Minister of Lithuania, Lance Bergis, thank you so much for joining us on Conflict Zone. Thank you.